Oh. Sitting here. Just move this a little bit. It's on the outside currently. Yeah. You need a clap? Yeah, give me a sync. Uh, sync clap. Let's go. Hey, it's Moog here from Mighty Car Mods. Originally from Grafton, rural New South Wales. My family's from Tasmania though. Uh, and I've been into cars for decades. I love them. My name is Marty from Mighty Car Mods. I've been in the cars for a long, long time, especially little nuggety hatchback cheap cars. The longest event I ever went to was actually earlier this year when we went to Le Mans in France, a 24 hour endurance race. I'd never been to one before, basically shutting down an entire town, an entire part of France to do this event. It's a really long circuit. The cars are absolutely astonishingly fast and the whole place just turns into a giant party. So that gave me a bit of a sample of what an endurance race might look like, but the scale is just next level. The race cars are next level. Everyone's in Ferraris and Lambos and all sorts of crazy stuff. I first became aware of K Car Global, I think just seeing a photo and I saw a photo of maybe like 20 or 30 K cars all lined up on this circuit. I didn't recognize the circuit, I didn't recognize anything about it, but I saw a bunch of K car race cars. I'm like, what is going on here? I assumed it was something that was happening in Japan. But then I looked closer and, and realized it wasn't in Japan and it said K car global and looked it up and it was in Malaysia. And I think the last event that happened was maybe 2017 and it was happening every two years. So 2019 rolled around. I wanted to try and attend that event, but we didn't quite make it. Then of course COVID happened and so it got stopped for a couple of years. But when I became aware of the event, I sort of bookmarked it in my brain and said, that's something I want to do. And we've been talking about it for years and years and years. So ever since then I've been saying, Malaysia, I really want to do Malaysia. We've done a couple of trips to Japan. We've done some cool adventures there. And I'm always in the top of my head was thinking we've got to do this Malaysia thing so it I saw it pop up again that it was being advertised it was going to run in 2023 and I said we're doing it when Marty told me about this K car endurance race in Malaysia I was just like I mean it's like we love little cars anyway whether they're minis or whether they're Japanese cars whether they're mini trucks but the idea of racing them and not just about top speed but about actually trying to endure to try and have enough mechanical sympathy to keep a little nugget going for 24 hours, I was like, that is my kind of fun and I am 100% in. It would have been just over a year ago, I think, that we first started talking about doing it uh, and to, trying to work out what it is, how it is we we're gonna make it all happen. It just so happens that Stacy, who's been working with us for quite a long time, is Malaysian. And so I started asking her questions and saying, how are we gonna do this? Because no Australian team, in, in my knowledge, has ever gone there and competed in this. And so it's very much set up for Malaysian people and Japanese people because there's organizations in both countries that sort of make it happen as a collaboration. So coming in as an Australian team, they didn't know either. They're just like, you want to what? And we're like, we want to come to your event. They're like, great. And lucky for us, the organizer is a very cool dude and he, uh, he helped make us happen. So between Stacey and Mr. Ravin, who's the organizer, we got it done. My name is Stacey Esmeralda Wilfred. My name is Julian James Quay. I was born and raised in Malaysia and I currently live in Australia. Born and raised in Malaysia. I currently live in Australia for the past eight years. I do not know anything about cars much, but I love the idea of racing them. I came back from work one day and Stacey's like, I think we're gonna go back to Malaysia. And I'm like, sweet, when? And she's like, no, we're not going back to visit our parents. We're probably going to go work on some cars and I'm like, what do you mean? And it's like, Marty just sent me an email about KCAR Global and he wants you to check out the regulations. So I've been helping out with organising things, uh, making sure that we've got the entry secured, hotels and flights, booking, basically all the paperwork and making sure that uh, we've, we've got all the car and car parts from Malaysia as well. Preparing for the journey was a huge, huge amount of work. We couldn't have done it without Stacey's help. Uh, we had to prepare, not just to get ourselves there, but to get eight, nine, ten people there. You have to have multiple drivers in an event like this. You cannot drive for 24 hours straight. Uh, it's just not a thing. To prepare, we had to dig deep and just do all the admin and paperwork, work out insurances, work out travel, work out where to stay, work out where the track was, work out how we're going to get that many people around inside Malaysia. So it's all the planning you do for just a holiday with your mates, but also we need to develop a car and, and find a car or take a car there as well, and then do all the, the dot all the I's and cross all the T's to get an entire team to another country, budget it, and somehow get all our stuff there, which was a whole other issue. I can't say that I've ever been involved in a race team where we've had to bring things in suitcases. Hey, I'm Ebony Doherty. I'm from Melbourne, Victoria. I've been going to racetracks ever since I was little, whether it was the Speedway in Bendigo, the drags out at Heathcote, Calder Park, you name an event, if it had four wheels and went fast, uh, I was there with my family. 
So this crazy idea to end up at the KCAR Global came about, the boys were chatting to me, we're at, funnily enough, a motorsport event, and they said to me, hey, you kind of get this world, you love it, would you come and race with us? Didn't ask any more questions, they'd never seen me drive before, they hadn't even had any referrals or spoken to anyone that's been a passenger in a Swift. Anyone that has been a passenger in my old Swift would probably tell them they're pretty brave for asking me to join them on the team, uh, but I jumped in and said yes. I remember about six months ago, Marty floated the idea to me about coming to Malaysia and mentioned that there was this event in Malaysia. My name is James Gregg. I'm originally from South Africa, but I've been living in Sydney, Australia since I was nine. I've loved cars for as long as I can remember. Now, being an avid K-Car fan myself, I was very aware of how big a presence they have in Malaysia. And also being a big motorsport fan, I knew how incredible Sepang was, but I didn't know that someone had decided to combine the two and run a 24-hour endurance race there, which is absolutely wild. As I'm sure Marty can remember, I instantly lit up when he mentioned this event in Malaysia. I'm like, yeah, so when are we going? And he's like, well, it's uh, later in the year. And I put that date on my calendar and I've been counting it down ever since. Uh, we've been doing a huge amount of prep to get ready for it. Um, but every single day, it's been enjoyable knowing that that big moment was coming soon. Hanging out like I don't give up. I get you filled up like a garbage truck. I see you on a Tuesday, maybe if you want to stay. I'll be jumping on you like I'm crazy. Bring the beat like you know you're not alone. You got me fired up like a dog into a bone. I'm rolling like I'm on and I'm gonna do Why? Why'd you buy this? Why? Why'd I buy what do you mean? Well, why? This one. We couldn't reveal it at the time because we weren't 100% sure that it would actually happen, but we knew that we were going to go and race in Malaysia and we knew that we needed a car to develop and work on. So I found this car on Facebook Marketplace. It didn't look like anyone else was going to buy it anyway. There was a nice Mighty Carmods connection in that it was the car that started the show, but also that it had been modified in a kind of Mighty Carmods style by someone who watches the show. So for me, it was just about getting the car securing it, and then we actually had a base to prepare for our Malaysian trip. This car is our base car for our Malaysian. <laughs> Are you serious? So, we're gonna build up this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, dude. No, dude. Holy you, cause, shit. Because we said that we had to buy one, right? Yeah. So we're gonna, we do, we, we, yeah, we, we'll do all this, of the prep on this. This is still censored. We'll do all of the prep on this. Get the roll cage aid, like no joke. Like, oh, we'll dude. Get, like, I've got goosebumps. That's such can you me see, too. Can you see my goosebumps? That's such a good idea. That's how excited I am about this. Any exhaust up, all any seats, stuff, whatever. Engine stuff. Take all of that out. Break stuff. Put it in a shipping container, send it over, and then just buy a local one and put all the stuff in. That is actually what it's oh, for, all jokes aside. Brilliant. That is genius. That is a good idea. Building the little rusty car was such a game changer and I think it was a really big reason why this trip worked. I'm not gonna call it a car, it, the rusty thing. Uh, we got that sort of up and running and wired and we made sure that we had a plan in place to make sure that everything was gonna be perfect. My name's Dave Forrester, I'm from the hills. I don't know that I do like cars a lot. No, I do. They're just frustrating and we all know that they are. We built the rusty car and took it to our local track and we got to thrash it around there. Now, I've done thousands of laps in my little red one that I had around this track. Instantly, it felt really familiar. It made it so much easier to get used to the car and know how it would react. What was a lot better in this car is we have a really nice bucket seat in the car. It was a little bit high for me, but it also meant that I was staying in the car and I was much more relaxed before than when I was riding with no seat. Everyone said the car performed really, really well. Um, Scott was there, he was checking over data logs and making sure everything was perfect. And he said the car performed really, really well. So I didn't really have any worries about it. Hatchbacks are basically the supreme vehicle shape of choice. They're just really, they're fun to drive. You can chuck them around and they're the best in every aspect of cars. Hello, my name is Yingbot. I am from Melbourne, Australia and I like little cars, small cars, cute cars, and I like being on track with them. So I received a phone call from Marty a few months ago and I looked at my phone and I thought, oh, Marty's calling. Maybe I need to help them with something or some this is gonna be a cool phone call. Stepped out of work, took the phone call and Marty said to me, hey, do you wanna go to Sepa and before he'd even finished, I was like, yeah, absolutely, I'll go to Malaysia. I think it had just sunk in for a second and I wasn't gonna miss the opportunity. My name is Isaac Ware. I'm from the Blue Mountains in New South Wales, Australia. Um, I have been into cars my whole life, amongst other things that I do. Um, I build and repair musical instruments for a living and cars are really my downtime. I was lucky enough to come along on the practice day with the, the little Daihatsu and um, 
you know, at first I was looking at that car thinking like, why, why are we doing this? What are we doing in this little, little hatchback? Because I sort of don't really have any experience with that sort of car. And um, as soon as I sort of heard that um, Ying was involved and a few of the other guys on the team were involved, I think I just switched on that tiny little competitive part of me and went, right, let's go thrash on this nugget for a day and just see how it feels. And you know what? I left that day thinking, I want one of these little Sears. Like, I will buy one tomorrow. Practicing in Australia was great in that it gave us an opportunity to drive the car. It had been dialed in actually really nicely despite how it looked. It was actually a fantastic car to drive on the track. Um, had a lot of fun in it, but then knowing that we actually weren't going to take that car and we just packed parts into suitcases, it was whatever we could carry over. So that was always going to be interesting, the fact that we had practice in one car and we were hoping that the car in Malaysia was going to be similar even though there was a very different time frame to build it in. That was like the first time I've, I've driven on a track. It was really nerve wracking, but because like there's so many supportive people around me, the team was really great. Like everyone was giving tips and tricks. And because of that, like I felt more confident at least like driving in a, uh, in a track. I think it's just a, a moral boost basically because like I've never driven on a track before. Stacey's killing it in here, everybody. She's going great. The little rusty die had to actually felt really good on the track. I think the main part was less about the experience on the track and more about how you actually work out the logistics of how do you swap drivers, how do you set up the seats, how do you kind of make one car suitable for eight different people of very different experiences and very different body types. And so I think there's kind of as much practice and experience required in that as there is in the actual driving. We packed everything up, took the wiring loom, took the ECU, all the sensors, everything that we needed to race the car. Yeah, I turned up at the airport. Uh, my first impressions of uh, flying internationally was actually just super easy. I didn't really think about it. I was lucky I sat next to James on the plane and him and I can just chat for hours. So I'm pretty sure we upset some people on the plane just uh, chatting for eight hours straight about everything you can think of. And um, as far as getting to Malaysia, that was a total shock to the system. I told Stacey the first thing you guys are probably gonna feel is the heat and the humidity. Holy smokes, Malaysia is hot, it's humid. The second we stood out of the plane, it was a furnace and we got there at 11 p.m. at night. It's like standing next to, you know, a bus that you, you're getting ready to jump on a bus in the middle of the city and you get that heat from the, the radiator on the side of the bus just blasts you and it's like this humid, thick air and that's how it felt from the moment we got off the plane. But the people are awesome, they're so friendly, the food's fantastic um, and I just, like, the car culture there is also really, like, it's really fun. And everyone speaks English. Well, most people that we met speak English, which was so helpful to kind of work our way around the place. But I was very excited when I got there to just explore. It was just this amazing place of light and culture that I'd never experienced before. I want everyone to experience the culture, the food. The food is so good. I just want everyone to try every little bits of like every different culture, the Indian culture, the Malay culture, the Chinese culture that combines into one. So I just wanted everyone to experience that. We're about to see a car that we bought off the internet. Sight unseen, of course, for the very first time. So good. Everybody, here it is. Look. The all new Mighty Car Mods Perodua Kalisa. So, we actually bought the Perodua on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, Stacey and Julian helped us do that. Uh, they organised to go and meet up with the seller. And it's four door. Look, it is blue as well. We did want to get a blue turd. Anyone who's been watching Mighty Car Mods for long enough will remember the blue turd. It was a mad little car that I had. I did enjoy taking that to the racetrack as well. It was engine swapped, it was fast, it was a lot of fun. It's also rusty and so it had to go, so that's why it got crushed. We thought getting a four door version of the blue turd would be pretty cool. Being that they're a car that we've identified with since we started Mighty Car Mods from the very first episode, uh, we decided we get a blue one. You can only get them in four door in Malaysia if they're a locally made one. Now, it did have Daihatsu badges on it, but I think someone had badge engineered it. It was actually a Perodua. And it was a bit rough. It was full of Hello Kitty as well, which is kind of hilarious. So with endurance racing, you need a lot of parts, a lot of tools, a lot of support, and you need the car itself. We have basically none of those. We've got a couple of mates to help us and two suitcases. So we have a race car in a suitcase and that thing. In these bags, we've got our wiring, we've got our parts, all of the stuff race that suits. we set up in Australia uh, in advance on our local little Daihatsu. Uh, it's all here, we've ripped it all out, and then we have 48 hours to put all of this into that. I arrived a week earlier 
to strip the car off and to get the roll cage bolted in it. So our first initial process was to strip the entire interior. We got the carpet and the roof lining off and then we dry assembled the cage outside the car to make sure that it actually fits the car. Yeah, everything lined up perfectly well and then took a bit of adjusting to get it in the right spot but as soon as it was in the right spot it was pretty easy. When we got to Malaysia and got to the car finding out that it was actually a completely different engine and not the same engine that we had in Australia. When I looked and it had a cam sensor and a crank sensor and we had no idle control and it was all just completely different. I was a little bit surprised because uh, in my mind, there's just one engine, it's just one car. They're, they're all the same, they're, ev everything is exactly the same. So that was a bit of a challenge knowing that I had to rewire that crank and cam sensor with the loom that was originally on the car, cut up that loom that we just made and everything was perfect. And then sort of ghetto wire with what I had because I didn't bring a whole wiring kit because everything was ready to go. I didn't have every single tool in my toolbox because it was ready to go. So I love the challenge of trying to get, getting it to work and it was, it was a success uh, getting it up and running. It was an educated guess, um, but yeah, it, we got there. Not having the right tools to check everything to make sure everything was actually right, like a timing light was a bit tricky. So it was kind of just a bit of an educated guess, but it seemed to go okay. All right, first drive. Bog stock in our little nugget. Taco is really handy, actually. But it feels like a Daihatsu Sior, doesn't it? Yeah. Whoa. This would be us at Sepang, dude. F1 circuit in this. Yeah, I know. I love it. Yeah, man. Motor feels healthy to me. It does feel good. When I first saw the Kalisa, I kind of had a giggle. You, you get there and you're like, it's so tiny. Um, you know, what's it going to be like to, to drive? You just, you don't quite know what to expect. We took it for a drive and I thought, yeah, it's pretty good. We were starting off with a pretty good base, I think. I, at that point, I was pretty confident we we're going to get it done. I became aware of Rab Garage a couple of years earlier, um, just hunting around for Daihatsu parts. And there's a lot of them in Malaysia. These guys have front cuts and parts and all sorts of aftermarket stuff, some good, some bad. One option was to go to Rab. It turned out that they'd been quite competitive in earlier races, so they knew a bit about the event. We had the other option of just doing it in a random garage somewhere, and that was one option, but we thought maybe it'd make sense to be in or around a workshop in case we needed spares. The way that the cars are worked on in Rab Garage was unlike anything I'd really seen before for professionally. Marty and I had obviously had lots of experience working on cars on jack stands and things like that, but at the workshop, people are working on the cars on jack stands, on the ground, in oil, in dirt. There's stray cats everywhere. There's really, really limited tools. And some things just as simple as, at one point I said, can I get a pry bar? And well, they don't have pry bars. And I was told they don't have them in Malaysia. Do you have tin snips? Well, we don't have those either. So they're kind of doing a lot with a very limited palette of tools. Raja, who's the owner of Rab Garage, has let us use his undercover space here. So we were before over on the street. We thought we were going to be pulling apart the, the car right then and there in the sun, but he's let us use this space, which is basically a back alley. There's cats here. There's a woman cutting up some chickens over there. Uh, and with our mates, this is where we'll be creating our race car. So I've put together a somewhat extensive list of stuff we have to do. There's a lot. Um, we probably even have to get the engine out, which is a big job in itself, but we have all this stuff that we have to do to pass scrutineering. If it's not done, they will not let us on the track. So we've only got a bit over a day. It's time to get into it. Today is Wednesday. Friday morning, the car has to be finished. Yep. Let's go. We were given a very, very small space in the back of the shop that was uh, very dirty and very hot. Having built the car here and having worked on a few of these cars, I knew that what we had planned would be achievable in the time that we had. We like to do um, reliability stuff and cooling and heat management and brakes and things like that, safety stuff, but you're not allowed to try and just make it faster. So we had a very short amount of time to get a lot of mods done, mostly for reliability and stuff that we developed in Australia before we left. We were very, very tight on time. Uh, when we were preparing the car, there were so many uh, little challenges along the way that sort of hit me and I guess we were all just moving forward pretty quickly so we didn't pause long on these things but the engine was kind of different to the one in Australia. That was kind of the first thing. There was little minor details that were just definitely different to the Rusty Nugget here. The lack of tooling, we sort of only just had like a half inch socket set and some cool spanners and things and for me, I'm sort of used to that so I'm not going to say I've, I've got like every tool at home and I'm a bit of a MacGyver so I kind of liked that in a way but I think when there's 
eight people working on a car and you've only got one set of tools, things become really tricky to be done in a timeline. We were using very basic tools, we had no hoist and for me, not just filming but also working on the car as well, we had no light. Um, it was a very, very dark space that maybe had two fluorescent tubes in it that were dwarfed by the sun outside that was creating a huge amount of glare inside. Only once it actually started to get darker outside was it a lot easier to see inside and that made it a lot harder to work and just the fact that the heat was so extreme. We had a big fan going but it wasn't doing much. Once the rain came it actually started to cool down a little bit but still being so humid it was still challenging. Cross your fingers Do the honors and toes. Eye Go for it mate. That's not great. So it didn't start, as you could see. Wants to go. One more time, please. Give it some throttle. Yes! 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 Davo! Good job, everybody. Sounds weird. Exhaust leak. Massive exhaust leak. So that's exhaust shot, that's where we're gonna go next. The exhaust was a really challenging part of the build because we had ordered an off-the-shelf catback system to put on the car and then we also had a set of headers to go on as well. Now when we tried to fit the headers we had to decide whether we wanted headers or an oil cooler and while the headers might have given us a bit more power we decided to go with an oil cooler instead which meant that we had stock headers. The other headers that we've got that are on this car look okay so I think that's what we're gonna have to run with but it means more mods to the exhaust. Bummer. Trying to fit that exhaust up to the car was a big challenge. We managed to just jimmy it on, but we knew that we had to go past an exhaust shop, so we headed over to a local one to fit the exhaust. It looked a lot more like a conventional workshop that we're used to seeing even here. It was well lit, they had a bunch of cars pumping in and out, and everything looked really normal. But of course it's Malaysia, so it wasn't going to be normal, and uh, Blake and I specifically were quite surprised at some of the things that we saw while we were trying to film there. A big thing in Malaysia seems to be the cats. There seems to be cats everywhere, not just on the streets, but there seems to be cats in the workshop, and often they have their own workshop cat. This shop actually had a cat family in it, which was quite odd. The home for the cats ended up being in a scrap metal pile in the corner of the shop, which is where the saw was, where they were shooting sparks into, and the cats seemed to know exactly when the sparks were coming and when to move out. The biggest surprise was the guy actually working on the car. I have never seen someone work like this ever. They wore no welding mask. I didn't know if it was real or not, because I was looking at Blakey as we were filming, and I was saying, Blake, is this guy just staring directly at the weld? And he showed me a shot that he got where this guy is just staring dead on at this weld and it is, you can see it reflecting off his eyes and he doesn't seem to bat an eyelid. They work very, very differently here. I don't know how the guy can see, I don't know how his eyes work, but he seems to have a special kind of welding shield that turns on and off as he's welding because he was doing a great job and the welds were perfect. We got it to the exhaust shop, which was great. We got it driving, which was great, but we still hadn't done a wheel alignment. We still hadn't bled the brakes. We were having dramas with the brakes. Everything was a bit old and rusty. The fluids hadn't been changed for a long time, which really sort of held us back. So some of those things that could have been fine, but were problems, was when I started to get a bit worried about whether we'd actually make it. Cannot see on the windscreen. It's pissing rain in a thunderstorm. We're hot. We have not tested the car. Dave's got his laptop out and like checking the trims. All that tuning work back home has paid off because the car is driving, but this is not how I expected to be tuning a car today. But we're doing it. had any doubts that the car would actually be ready in time for the race. I've known Marty for 20 years now and he has a kind of tenacity that means that he just doesn't give up and he always finds a way and Marty's thing is always like it'll be fine, it'll be great and Isaac was similar and having Dave there and having other friends there as well just to support the whole process it made it actually a really magical journey because there was always someone there to have a chat to, always someone there that could help just people that have a really wide breadth of skills.
So just a little over 24 hours ago, this car did not exist in this format mm -hmm. at all. Uh, but uh, yesterday and today, basically with hand tools and a whole bunch of help from both locals and our friends that we brought in, uh, we got a little race car now, which is amazing. When we first drove up to Sepang Circuit, we drove the car down there, which is about an hour's drive from Rab Garage. It drove really well. Then driving up to the circuit and seeing the giant hill and all the signage and the ripple strips and just seeing how absolutely massive it was, was very, very exciting. I knew that it was a Formula One circuit, but I just didn't know how big it was going to be and when we first turned the corner and I saw it say Sepang up on the hill I'm like this is the real deal. One straight is ginormous you can't see the end that way you can't see the end that way and then knowing that there's a whole another one on the back of that grandstand that you're looking at it was it was pretty wild it was really really big. I would compare it to big tracks in Australia like Sydney Motorsport Park and Phillip Island which I've driven on but Sepang was like even better than that. that Sepang makes those tracks seem like little baby tracks compared to it. A proper circuit a proper race I could see all the other race teams there, they're unloading their cars, they've got their race crews on, they've got mechanics, they've got trucks, they're shipping containers, and I'm like, oh shit, like it's on proper. I didn't actually know much about endurance racing. I learned a little bit when I was at Le Mans actually to sort of see how it all works, but that's the highest of high end. So this race in Malaysia is actually similar in some ways that you have like a Le Mans start and it is a pure endurance race. What I didn't realize is that a lot of 24 hour events, you don't actually drive for 24 hours. You might drive for seven and then have the night off and then drive for seven. That makes sense. That's a good idea because you get asleep, but this is actually legitimately 24 hours through. So the fuel of this race is controlled. This year is being controlled by the Japanese organizers. I think it's to limit overpowered cars or over pushing your car to the limit. If your power output dictates how much fuel you use and you're outputting too much power and you're winning but you use all your fuel, you can potentially lose the race and come last. From going to the driver's briefing, you think you're going to get a lot more information than what you actually received during the driver's briefing. They kept it pretty lighthearted for the teams. We've not tested the car. We don't know how far it's going to, you know, survive in race conditions and for how long. So you're kind of doing the maths to figure out how long the car's gonna go for, what does a stint look like, what do the tyres look like. There's lots to think about when you've got 24 hours to race. A lot of the information was oriented towards the Malaysian teams and the Japanese teams and there was a lot of talk about these being these two different nations. Because we were from Australia, we did remind everybody that yes, this year, there was an Australian team here as well. When we stood up, we got this massive round of applause and it was a really nice moment because I think people had kind of gone like, good on you, you've come from completely far away from a country that doesn't speak Malaysian or Japanese, which is the two languages that they were doing a lot of the briefing in, and then English as well, probably for our benefit. Uh, that was a really nice moment. It, it set it up to go, well, as long as our car works, we're going to have a great time. So something that happened after the, after the sign-in and after the driver's briefing was, I got a message from one of our teammates saying, there's some licensing people here and they want extra money, but it has to be cash and you will get a handwritten note that says you have a license. It seemed dodgy as basically. Me, Ying and Julian, we were supposed to meet up with the rest of the teams for dinner that day. So after locking up and closing up the pit garage, we were already heading off Sepang and I've got a phone call from Mr. Ravin, the organiser. He's like, oh, we've got some issue. Like, can you come back to the office? Like, we, we need to speak to you right away. So we turned back and we went to the office and the organisation needed extra money to process another set of licence for us so that we could continue with the race. And it was like about 70 to 80 ringgit per person. So we paid like about 560 for our team. And I had to fill up like a bunch of paperwork of uh, all our team details and things like that. I have no idea how organising race works out, but we had to do it anyway. So me and Stacey got all the forms done and the payment paid. So I don't actually know what happened there. All I know is we paid some cash, we got a license, and then we were allowed to drive. The night before the race, I was really nervous. I was happy we got the car to the track. I was stoked that it made it. I drove it there, everything felt good. The car was sitting there, it was set up, we had our signs up, we had our limited tools there, and we are like, well, we're as ready as we're ever gonna be. So we actually had a pretty good night that night, just went and relaxed. I was pinching myself, who gets the opportunity to drive Sepang with their mates in my favourite type of car ever, which is a K car, in a 24 hour endurance event. Some of the guys went out and had a couple of beers, but I was a little bit too nervous for that. So went to sleep, ready to get up early the next day. So after working on the car for two days and then having our Friday day to just to see what's happening at the track, we got there on Saturday ready to go. 
there was two hours of testing on the Saturday morning. I was really glad we got to take the car out and just see what it was like on the track. I'm feeling a bit nervous. First lap, maiden lap of this whole event for testing. And I have one lap because we don't have very much time. It's like time attack now. driven it. I'd driven it to Sepang and we'd driven it around the block, but no one else had. So uh, we got everyone in the car for about 15 minutes to, to sample the track and understand how we're going to change drivers. The first few laps of Sepang were great. I would say that they were slow because you are just trying to find your way in a whole bunch of traffic, just finding your spot, you know, knowing what gears to go down to. There was a few corners there where you would take second and trying to work out the apexes and really work on that flow because there's some incredible sections of the circuit where you can keep your speed and your momentum up so well and it's just so much fun. And so through that, the, the first few laps were all about finding your place on, on the circuit and then starting to build your confidence from there. Stacey, this is, our, this is where we've come to. Yeah, I know. A few weeks ago, we're in Australia, now you're in a race car. Yep. I was crying like I did. Blair and Julian was calming me down. They was like, Blair was like doing bread works with me. The adrenaline and the anxiety, like I just want to make sure that I drive properly and don't crash. So, but the moment like I hit the road, everything went away. Uh, you got this. We train for it, you know what you're doing. So Stacey learned to drive manual about two months ago. And up until we did some testing in Australia, never been on a racetrack. Now she's at Sepang. The car seemed okay, like, was driving fine. I, I really wasn't out there very long, and I thought, oh, okay, the car's maybe a tiny bit slower than the rest of the field. It was sort of keeping with some cars, and other cars were passing us. Every single piece of the car was new to give us the best fighting chance to actually survive during the race. However, I felt straight away that the car was definitely done on power. The main reference that I had was driving the rusty one around Sydney and it felt quite peppy. And I think from then we all had this kind of sense that no one wanted to say it. We didn't want to go, the car feels a bit slow, but after a few laps people were like, do you think there's something wrong with it? The car is slow it was very common feedback from everyone. Everything looked okay to a degree. Um, from the moment we started the car, it had a coolant pressure thing, but I put that down to me or the sensor or the wiring. I was like, it can't be reading that. It's not possible. It just can't be reading that. So I kind of just glossed over it a little bit. And then we went out on the track and the car was just slow. Once the practice session was finished, we had a couple hours to chill. And then after that, we, everyone had to meet on the main straight for what we were told was going to be a Le Mans start. The pre-race festivities were hilarious. Like seeing all of the different mascots. There's guys in uh, Mukau suits, Mario and Luigi. There's kids, there's these glamorous models out on the grid. We had Stacey rocking the koala suit. Like she absolutely killed it. For one day I could be a koala and just <laughs> dance around the, the Sepang circuit. Seeing all the live traditional music was a really, really good way to bring the vibe up to get everyone keen for this huge event that we had coming up. It was 
which is super fun and a little bit wacky as you would expect from people that are into doing K-Car endurances. They played the Malaysian national anthem and then the Japanese national anthem. That was meant to be the end of that part of the ceremony, but then our team all got together and sung the Australian national anthem as loud as we could. And what was really amazing is that all of the other teams listened to us sing our anthem and then afterwards just cheered and yelled and clapped so loud. And it was just a really nice way. It, it felt really like we were embraced and it felt like we were part of something special. It was a really kind of good vibe and the Le Mans start was a lot of fun. So everyone came out in their mascots with their team names and then the mascots had to run across the track and pull the sticker off the car which sort of enabled you to begin the race and then you'd line up behind the safety car, do a lap and then it was on. All the other teams work and prepare so much for this. So whilst it's meant to be a fun race, it's still competitive as hell. Like no one is giving an inch out on track. Like some of these guys racing are professional race car drivers. They do this, you know, on, on their spare weekends, gentlemen drivers. This car, it's preparation. I mean, it was a street car 72 odd hours ago. This thing drove itself to and from the track. That's crazy. All right, so obviously keep yourself alive. Number one, keep the car alive. Keep it calm for now. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon, 24 hours. So just, just so, take it easy for a bit. So chop everyone. over the start line so this is lap number one minute number one 24 hours to go oh, that is so cool. driver in the car. That was partly because I'd had the most time in the seat so far and I just wanted to make sure that it worked to make sure it made it around the track and once that had happened I was really happy just to hand the keys over, let everyone else jump in and get as much seat time as possible. They were fast going like first five laps was incredible. Pretty sure I saw Marty get lapped in five laps. so smooth out there. Coming in now, boys. All right, so Marty's done his first half an hour. He's coming into the pit stop now, and then uh, I'm gonna change over. Uh, we're currently just planning on doing half an hour each to keep the car going, make sure it's okay. Uh, and we still got a, we got a lot of time here. A lot of time ahead of us. Yeah. Thirty minutes in a car, even though it's not that fast, felt really, really long because it's quite fatiguing, gripping yourself in the seat, it's really hot as well, and actually legitimately dangerous. You've got cars dive bombing you on the inside, there's cars coming from the outside, you have to be totally switched on. I mean, it's not just a bit of fun, like if you get something wrong, you will die. This is, this is dangerous. You're not going at a really, really high speed, but there are many chances that things could go wrong, and if they do go wrong, they're going to go really wrong. Lap to 3.30, 3.30. I like this little bit through here. Hold a lot of speed through there. This corner here is a really tricky one. I 
off it's because we're on a really big track, but this car feels very, very slow and not just K-car slow. I love driving slow cars, but I'm like, this is slow. So I knew something was not quite right about it, but looking at the gauges, nothing was evidently wrong. So I thought maybe I'm slow. It, you could see it on the straight. It was very, very slow. And then for her to radio back in and say, Overheating! I was like, oh no, maybe that is actually real. Uh, about to do a driver change. Ying's coming in now. Isaac's about to head out. Yeah, the cooling got super hot. What did it go up to? 108. Really? Yeah. Uh, just looking back through the data logs, we can actually see that the coolant temp slowly, slowly crept, crept, crept. And they got to a point where it released on the cap and she actually saw it. So we'll just have to see how the car feels after this lap with Isaac on it. What's that? We've got some ignition timing issues in fourth gear. Go on temp high, go on temp high. Fourth gear, pinging its head off. The top of third, as soon as you grab fourth gear, any load, it's just pinging and getting hot. So we need to pull timing out of it or work out what the issue is. Right, Isaac is going to go out, even though we're due for a driver swap, he's going to go out again. He had the problem, he'll be able to help diagnose it if we do have an issue. We think maybe it's a wiring problem, he's making it run, like just ping and carry on and not be happy, which does make stuff overheat. Whether we've killed that engine and done a head gasket is the question that we'll answer now. No, it's okay, but more timing out of the top of fourth gear still. Marty had briefed me like if there's anything on the screen, if there's anything wrong, just come back into the pits. The oil cooler temperature was like, it says that it was high and I, I got panicked a little bit so I came back in and... We decided pulling the plugs was the best thing in the car and I was looking at the three plugs and I went, oh, number one's great, number two had like it, peppering all over it which was detonation, then number three. Oh gosh, it was just peppered with coolant and it was absolutely horrible. Marty and I kind of looked at each other and went, oh, hair gasket straight away. We probably should have picked it earlier, but in the sort of the heat of the event, the first thing you go to is like, let's look at the tune. Can we pull ignition timing out? Are we having an issue with fueling? So several discussions backwards and forwards between Marty and Dave. We established the car was broken. We decided that we're here, we're just gonna fix it and we're gonna pull the head off and fix the head gasket. It just so happened I brought a full gasket kit from Australia, which I'm really glad I'd done. When it comes to something going wrong with the car, it is a real testament to the teamwork that goes on. And I can tell you from not being someone that's mechanically on, on the tools myself, to sort of stand back and watch everyone hook in was incredible. The guys didn't need to do too much talking. It was just everyone knew where they needed to be and when they needed to be there. They just hooked in and got it done. I kind of really like when things go wrong in a way because it gives you the opportunity just to, to do your thing and that's kind of my lane is just fixing things. I fix things for a living and I was pretty confident that the car was going back together. One of the things that made all of this a great success is that Isaac has a little notepad with him and it's something that he writes in sometimes when he wants to kind of clear his head of different things and in there he had all the torque settings and all the specific information we needed to pretty much rebuild an engine and so sure enough that came out and that was like the magic book of Narnia that got us through the wardrobe of broken engines back into the field of dreams. One of the biggest issues we faced which actually almost sunk our entire weekend was we weren't able to get the head off because it's got like a hex key, like an Allen key socket that goes in and it's really small and you need sort of a special tool to get in there. And there were other teams that were really, really helpful and were helping us, but none of them had this specific tool. We did end up finding one, but someone had to get it out of their car. We couldn't work out why nobody had them. It turns out that People don't want to pull their heads off their engines in the pits. They'll bring complete replacement engines because if you pull the head off and you're in a stock class and someone seems an aftermarket cam in there, you're disqualified because you've modified your car. A cam makes a huge difference on a racetrack. When all the revs are high, you can make it breathe more. Um, there were cars that were in a stock class that would just get legs when it got to a big long straight and the revs were up. So potentially they had cams in them. So no one's taking the heads off. So they didn't bring the tool, but we eventually did find one. A guy had one in his van in the car park. We got the head off and we got it fixed. One of the guys, an, an older gentleman, brought some of the like foam to, to cut a duct because we were having heating problems and cooling problems. Uh, they thought we should probably duct our radiator to get better flow through there. So 
they brought some some like foam stuff and started just just did it. They just like, do you want us to help? We're like, okay, and they started cutting it out. And so we had better cooling on the side of the track in the pits. It was one of the most amazing and wholesome pit lanes I'd ever experienced in my life. I knew that we had Marty there, we had Isaac there, and we had Dave there. And the tenacity of each of them individually is stratospheric in its own right. The three of them together though, that's like Voltron, you know, and add me in there and it's like, I will go anywhere, do anything I need, I'll get a new engine. I, I mean, I was at one point going, do we need a new car? That's not in the rules, but like together and with the rest of the team, we would have got anything and done anything to make sure we finished the race. When I wasn't driving, I was very keen to check out the other cars because they were okay cars. Uh, the Japanese had some really interesting unlimited class cars, which were uh, based on old formula cars from Japan. I was told they were about 30 years old and they'd been modified to compete at this event. Also, there were some cars which were like Daihatsu Copens and Honda Beats, which had then been converted to look like, like baby GT40s. So that was really, really cute as well. And those cars were blisteringly fast on track um, and really, really reliable. They d didn't seem to have any issues during the event. Apart from that, we saw your usual uh, lots of Peridouas, Daihatsu Copens, the Honda Beats came from Japan, um, and just lots of little micro hatches. There were some uh, Daihatsu, I think they're called S's, uh, Honda Todays, so a fantastic mix of K cars, some of which we don't get in Australia. And just seeing how everyone had modified them to their taste, you could really clearly see which cars had come from Japan and which were the Malaysian cars as well. But all of them set up for 24 hour enduro, so it was awesome. That was two or three of the most hectic hours of my entire life. I'm going to uh, test it. I'm going to get suited up while they bleed the coolant and check the oil. Just do a lap and cross our fingers. I felt so relieved once we fixed the head gasket and we got to get out there and drive again. The car felt better. Uh, we fixed the fueling and wiring problem as well at the same time. Every time it came in and we had a block of time, we, we knew, look, we might not win, we might come last, but we really, really want to finish this race. Everything was about making the car work, making it survive and finishing the race. Let's go, mate, let's go! There goes nothing. I feel pokey up. Everything seems okay so far. Temperatures, pressures look good, so I think we're okay to do some laps. We noticed we're sort of getting like 330s, then it sort of dropped into the 320s. I think my best was a low 320, but then we started going quicker than that. And Julian jumped in, who I hadn't seen drive before. I knew he was a um, motorsport mechanic, and I knew he had a lot of experience with rallies and stuff, but I didn't know he was this fast. When I first got my license, I done some few grassroots time attack and I've also done a Red Bull driver search before so it was a competition between Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, Brunei. I finished the top 66 in that event so I have some I wouldn't say big track experience on my belt but yeah I've done a few competitions by myself. As the sun was setting uh, the atmosphere changed completely suddenly everyone's got headlights on there's these little cars running past you the track is really really well lit which is great so you can see the circuit no problem but it's absolutely got a different atmosphere when the sun goes down and it was awesome. It felt like you had the whole place eerily to yourself it was just us out there. It's black in the distance and you just it's you completely focused on the track especially after we've been driving for so long it was a really good way to hunker down and try and focus on driving and just seeing how many laps we could get and it was a surreal experience. Here we go! To try and concentrate on this really big circuit was really quite hard especially because our car was still quite a bit slower than a lot of the pack and everyone really was dive bombing you people were going for lap times despite it being such a long event and you had to make sure you weren't the one crashed into and sometimes I mean you had to avoid people. It was great hearing the feedback from everyone again that the car felt so much quicker. The funny thing about that was it had so much less timing than the car in Australia. So it had very, very, very conservative numbers in it and everyone said, no, it feels amazing, don't touch it. It was kind of a real uh, uplifting win for everyone, I think. Oh, it's got so much grip. This feels amazing. Once it started working, uh, my 
my parents came by at night. Um, that's a bit emotional for me. I mean, this is their first time in a track as well. Like, it's funny how like they lived in. Oh my god. It's funny how they lived in Malaysia and they've never experienced Sepang. So my parents was watching it from above, from the rooftop. And when it was my turn again, and Mari said it was my turn again, I'm like, can I bring my, my parents into the pit? And they were like, yes, bring them in. So they were sitting there watching me drive through the screen. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm just glad that they are able to witness this and that I'm able to share this with them as well. And I hope they are proud of me. But I'm pretty sure I know my mom was like praying the whole time. So <laughs> My mom is so cute. Like, I'm pretty sure she's praying the whole time for me not to crash. Good to go? Yeah, I think you're good to go. Thank you. Thank you. I was definitely struggling with the gears. Like second gear, I could just not find it. And the worst part was that on those two corners where you need second, you're into that corner with five cars on you. You felt like you were a sitting duck out there. Uh, I feel like I was pretty quiet in the car, but it was those moments where I couldn't get second, I became pretty vocal. I am struggling with second gear so bad. adjusting the leverage on the pedal. Um, I had a couple of goes at this today and it lets me cheat a little bit more adjustment at the cable for whatever reason. I mean, it kind of appears that I'm just adjusting the position of the pedal, but it's also moving around over the course of the day. So, you know, heat, this thing's constantly hot, so everything's just getting bigger. So we're just essentially just trying to tighten it back up for the next driver. We're having trouble finding second gear and reverse, that sort of thing. So hopefully this just gives us that, um, that little bit more we need. Drive the car successfully, we had to rev match, which is hard because you kind of got to heel tow it and get the, the revs perfect. If you've ever had your clutch basically completely stop working, that's what we had to do at speed with other people overtaking us. was driving around and radioed in and said to the guys, hey, did we have second gear? Um, Isaac replied, yeah, we've got second gear. I'm like, we don't anymore. I can't get second anymore. I think it's gone. second maybe uh, I was really impressed with the team and how they handled it because we were trying to figure this out the whole time every time we changed drivers we'd bring it in just the clutch adjust the clutch adjust the clutch we even asked the rab guys what do you think about the clutch and in the end I'm pretty sure the clutch is <laughs> what did us in we tried really really hard to keep the car going as long as we could and just to keep getting as much laps in as we could but eventually the clutch just was not helping us and we had to bring the car in to actually realize that we need to we need to change this gearbox So really late on Saturday night, uh, I called everybody in for a meeting and we sat down and we just went, we need a bit of a game plan, what are we going to do? At this point I was like, do we actually go and get another engine, do we get another gearbox, what do we do? What we did know is that we weren't just going to go to sleep, I mean we still at this point had another 12 hours of the race and what we were really certain about is that we wanted to cross the line at the end of the race. You've got to remember, you could do 300 laps, 400 laps, if you don't cross the line at the 24 hour point, you're out, you are a DNF, you do not finish, that is it. So. It was really important to us that we actually completed the task and it was basically decided that we would stay up, 
get the parts that we needed. If anybody could get a couple of hours sleep, they would, and then we would change the gearbox and keep driving. I think it was really cool that we kind of battled out with these issues with the car, the head gasket and now the gearbox issue, but it, at the end of the day, it still felt like we all wanted to finish this thing and, you know, that was, that was the biggest goal for everybody was literally just crossing the finish line. We came to Malaysia with three, four, maybe five suitcases of parts. Uh, that's it. So we didn't have a container, we didn't have anything else, we just had those parts. So we didn't have spare gearboxes, spare engines. That would be the smart thing to bring to a race like this. Um, Rab Garage put one aside for us, but we didn't have a way to get it to the track. Our car was already full, our support van was already full. And we thought, look, if we really need it, we will give up the hour just to go and pick it up. Uh, we were hoping because we had such low power and we had new parts that we, we wouldn't probably need a spare gearbox, but we ended up having to go and get one. Okay, so it is nearly midnight. Me and Davo are gonna head back to Rab Garage. They kindly left us the key. We're gonna go to Rab throw the spare gearbox into the van, drive it back to the track. Then I think we're gonna shut down for a bit, let the car cool down. Then we're gonna put the new gearbox in, because currently you can drive it, but the this, this, this synchros are like toast. So we need another gearbox. I actually really enjoyed the drive, driving out. I don't sleep much in life, so it was kind of fun to go out on an adventure at night and go see the cats again and um, pick up the gearbox. During this time, we're like, let's just drive it in whatever gear we can select. Uh, so the boys went out, drove it a bit more, and then I think at around 1 a.m., Dave and Marty have come back with the gearbox. Gearbox. If we had any chance of actually finishing the race, just for our own mental states, we actually had to take a break. Let's just get two hours sleep and we'll start again tomorrow. We've gone into whatever crevice we could find in the pit garage um, and slept for two hours before doing it again the next day. Marty walks out all bleary eyed and it's just, he's in, you know, I can see he's in game mode. So I was like, all right, we're on. So we started pulling the car apart more and doing all the loud stuff with the, with the DAC. I got out of the restroom and Dave and Marty were already thrashing on the car. Both of them looked so tired. I think Dave had been up before anybody and he just started pulling the car apart. And you know, this, this is the thing, none of us wanted to stop or have the car broken and everyone just found these little pieces of energy to, to put the thing back together. And at that point, there's three of us on the car. There's Dave, Marty and myself. I was surprised we all got our second wind at 5 a.m. I, I was feeling really wrecked, but I just thought, nah, we're here. We're going to do it. We've got till midday. We have to get this car across the line. We had a weird approach of trying to remove the transmission without dropping the engine or the subframe. Which you can't do. We found that out. The guys around us just took over and they gave us the biggest helping hand ever. Um, I kind of just backed out and just walked backwards. Isaac was a little bit the same. It's just yeah, like, this is wild. Like, whatever's happening here is wild. It's actually nearly impossible to get in there to do anything. They're so keen seven people working like two on the top two on the bottom two from the side and then one just like diving through the middle just they're all just undoing things it was wild uh, it was crazy to see and i think they were kind of excited to work on a broken car again because they're so good at what they do now they don't have broken cars so the kind of the fun of fixing a broken car i think it was kind of fun for them to to do again so it was great to see the camaraderie it was it was yeah it was amazing I was just, I was blown away by the generosity because they didn't have to help. Um, they didn't know us, they are just our neighbours. They just saw that we were getting it done. We'd been working constantly on the car, which they had been watching us do that as well. I think they had one or two issues themselves. They might've changed an engine in maybe 40 minutes. They had spares, they're ready to go. They were really efficient. Uh, and they just saw us and they just, next thing I knew there was like five, six, maybe more guys all there just pulling stuff out. They just said, can we help? And we went, yep. And next minute there was just parts flying through the air and tools flying through the air and more hands in the engine bay than I've ever seen. They were like, we want to help out. It gives us something to do. It's a little bit of the action. They wanted us to finish just as much as we wanted to. It was incredible to see that despite even a language barrier that everyone chucked in a hand and made it happen. I can't remember exactly how long it took us to fix the car. Maybe it was an hour, maybe it was two hours, but we had to really pull it apart. So our entire cooling system came out. Our entire wiring loom came out. We had to change all the fluids that have to come out to do that job. We discovered that the clutch was completely blown to bits. Don't know how it happened. Don't know if it was a, a premature failure of that factory part. 
we think maybe our pressure plate just had too much clamp force. Maybe it was too heavy duty for what we were trying to do. But luckily, I had last minute, I had brought this, the old clutch with us in a cardboard box. It was covered in oil and grease and we just decided to slap that in and go for it. What I heard when other people had fixed their cars, I could hear this applause, I wasn't sure at first what it was, and then I realised when people had failures, something broke and the car went in and then the mechanics worked on it. When the car came back out, it was other teams applauding. The crowd erupts, we erupt, high fives, hugs everywhere. Thank you so much. That feels good. Headlamps are on. I got second gear. Yeah, we're in the game. All the gears work. Repeat, all the gears work. Back in the game. Clutch is slipping though. So I went out first, tested it. The clutch was slipping, which had me really worried. At that point, I started to get like the cold sweats going, maybe it's over. Maybe this clutch is going to slip. Then I remembered the clutch disc was covered in grease, so it had to burn off. Something had to happen with it. I think we're good. We take care of the car, but we'll just have some fun now. So I did a, I did a couple of laps. The car seemed to work all right. I came back in, I remember just saying, you guys might have to drive around it, but just go for it. And by then, I ran out of energy and everyone else jumped in. Uh, the gearbox feels amazing, the clutch is a bit slippy but also our adjustments are all out now and that clutch was covered in crap. It was a hard compromise between the clutch we put in that wrecked the last gearbox or this clutch which is probably too soft but we just got to drive around a bit, just have some fun now. It was interesting just seeing the energy change within the team. I know um, I noticed Blair switch on, I noticed James switch on. It kind of made us feel like, yes, we might actually be able to do this. Everyone was being enthusiastic. They're like, we can do it, we can do it. But the we can do it was kind of said with maybe a, a little seed of doubt. But once we knew that the gearbox was working and the car was going again, we're like, we might actually finish this thing. Isaac's gonna jump in next. Um, and then basically we're gonna run through everyone. I'm gonna go last if the car's still working. Uh, and we're going to keep running through everybody, keep the car going out and keep chopping as many uh, as many other little nuggets as we can. Absolutely. Job, Thanks, bro. All right, let's go. All of a sudden, our energy from being tired, run down, worn out, was had this little tiny competitive like camaraderie about it where we're just pushing each other and the car's going faster and there was just a new energy in the team. And at that point, I didn't think about the car not finishing. I knew we were making it home. That's right. Have fun, Stacey. We're really starting to feel it on Sunday morning. So, especially the guys that have been up all night, Dave, for example, um, he was pretty cooked by the time we we're getting near the end of the race. Once that car did probably about 10 or, yeah, 10 or 12 laps, Blair just looked at me and just goes, you should go have a sleep. I was like, eh. The sun's up, like it's, nah. And he's like, no, 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 you should, it, like, it's working. You should probably just go have a rest now. So I went and had a little rest under the aircon, which was nice for a little bit, and then wandered back out and then set up, set up my chair and just kicked back. I had the radio in my hand and I just sort of drift in and out of sleep. And then somebody would say, yeah, I'm coming back in. I'm like, oh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it was good. I was very much awake. I was there, but I wasn't there, but I was there. So my first lap out after the car's been fixed, Again, I was like, oh, I've taken second gear for granted. It is so nice to have second gear. Oh, we have second gear again. How nice. What a treat. Holy crap, the car feels really good. So I'm going around driving laps and I'm noticing race cone is kind of flashing green at us. And I'm like, oh, like I'm able to set some good laps. The car felt absolutely beautiful. And there's one point where I'm turning into a corner and I, I can see all these K cars around me. I've got four or five on one side 
I've got one on the right and I'm kind of just like, go around, go on the left. And the one on the right's just dive bombed down on the dirt because he's obviously not bothering to go around the other cars. That's the fastest way. I just started laughing and I was just like, this is surreal. Oh man, that last in was the best. It was so good. That was the most comfortable that I'd felt in the car uh, all weekend. And, and you could see it. It was evident in the lap times as well that, you know, we were going faster, it was smoother, and it was just fun. Once we started to find our pace, I was just kind of doing it for the country. Uh, it's one of the things that Marty and I have spoken about a lot on the track. I love going to a track day and having fun, but I do, I do get the red mist. Wouldn't actually consider myself a competitive person, but I did say that out loud recently to a bunch of friends, and they're like, man, you're pretty competitive. So I don't know. Martin, would you consider me competitive? I'm going to tell you if he's nodding or not. Would you think I'm a competitive person? On a track, absolutely. On a track? So yeah, on a track. I mean, generally, you know, not, but like, I'm like, I'm here to win for my team, not for myself, but for the team, even though it's an endurance race. Thank you. Once I came back into the pits, it was ready for my turn and I noticed that Isaac was actually suited up, ready to go, but credit to him, he was very, very nice. He looked at me and he goes, do you want your last drive? And I'm like, if you don't mind. He's like, no worries. He let me have the drive and I got in the car for the final time and I was so, so, so keen. This is now just get over the line territory. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we have a chance. I'm not coming last. Don't break the car, let's finish it. I'm like, don't worry, cuz. <laughs> Blair and I, we love our competition between each other and I thought, well, I have to get him. After a couple failed attempts of a hot lap, I decided I've got one more go in this. So I absolutely sent it out of the final corner, ready for turn one to get as much speed as I could for a good starting flying lap. If you look closely, you can see I'm constantly looking at the iPad screen, watching my time go either up or down, so I know in real time how my sectors are going. I was so keen to make sure I beat Blair, and it was the one thing I wanted to do. I saw the footage, he was looking back at that timer, and he had the red mist. Matched it to the millisecond. I mean, it, it's, it was something, something, point six eight. And then he went out and had his run and came back in and we actually checked the data and it was point six eight. It was exactly the same. I mean, he could drive. I can drive too. There is one hour to go, I exactly. Um, engine's come it. out, the gearbox has changed. Head gasket. It's been a big, big night. It's rough, almost no sleep. Um, a lot of these cars are still going. A lot of really impressive results. A lot of people are actually now camping out though in their pits because they don't have enough fuel but they want to finish the race. So they're just like waiting now and they'll send it for the end. If you don't get over the checkered flag, you're disqualified. So you could be 400 laps deep, which would mean that you were going to win. If you ran out of fuel now, that's it. So um, we need to make sure we finish. Stace is out there now. Yep. Uh, and then if the car is still working, Marty will take over, do the last 20 minutes take us over the line and uh, the car just has to keep working. I was never worried about coming last, I was worried about failing. And by failing, for me, was not finishing. 
We had the tools, um, they were basic. We had, you know, a lot of expertise with my mates. None of which, I think Julian's the only qualified mechanic out of everyone that came with us. Um, and he was a huge help. Isaac was a huge help. Uh, Dave's wiring expertise as well. There was sort of a bunch of guys that were really focusing on that side of things and the rest of the team would focus on other areas which were equally as important, like making sure everyone had all their safety gear, everyone was strapped in properly, making sure our equipment was working so we could film the thing and show you guys. So I got to do the final drive. Um, it was a tough one to decide really because crossing the finish line of any race is a really, really, like it's a privilege really, especially in a team sport. In Le Mans I noticed some drivers would, you know, some would start, one would finish. And, and, uh, and we just kind of worked out a rough order of, of driving, not based on any, any real reasoning. We just kind of decided that's what we do. And so when we got towards the end, especially after all the struggling we had, everyone just said, you do it. So I was pretty stoked. Let's go! Let's go, let's go! Let's go! Pretty wild out here, people. Someone just flew up behind me. The race leader was in front of me, but slowed down because I think he ran out of fuel. It's just chaos. There's probably only a couple of laps left. Some people still sending it. That guy's lapped me already. Just absolutely chaotic. My voice is gone. I'm out of energy. I've had no sleep. But I'm loving it. It's so good. Like the ultimate track day, man. Just amazing. Amazing, amazing. What an experience. It's only a couple minutes left. Just gonna send it. So we're getting close to 12 p.m. the next day, literally laps away from finishing a 24-hour endurance race. And that was one of our really big goals. Let's just finish. It doesn't matter where we place, let's just finish. So we're all, anyone who's not driving, we're all up climbing the pit fences like we're at Red Bull and about to win the championship, holding our breath, just hoping that the car comes around for another lap. And then we hear the two minute call, the one minute call, and we're all looking at our watches. You know, we knew the end was in sight and every time Marty went past on those last laps, we're just yelling at him, we're screaming and waving our flags in the air. Like so much, so much pride. <laughs> What I think is great is that a show that started about do-it-yourself has evolved into this thing. Do it yourself, learn, do it with your mates. What an experience. In the same car that started the show. Proof that you don't need lots of money, you don't need heaps of stuff. To have an amazing experience. So cool. It was so nice with the team sitting on the side of the grandstand watching everyone come through but we were all looking for one car and that was a little small blue projoir. 24 hours let's race these dudes up the straight and we see this little bloody calissa cross the line the whole team was jumping up and down everyone was screaming we we're waving flags the elation that comes over you is just like what have we done like We've achieved something that was just totally not possible. You know, we made a car do a 24-hour endurance race with like no endurance, this 250,000 kilometer old car with every issue you could think of. It was, it was incredible. The feeling was, I can't even describe it. It was, it was very emotional for a lot of us. Some might say it's because we were sleep deprived. Some might say we were dehydrated, but it was just an amazing feeling. Seeing that little car, that little nugget, Across the line, just these awesome teammates and friendships that will last forever. Yay! Well done, Martin. The moment he got out of the car, we just drenched him with water. We just saturated him with screaming and hugging and yelling, and I think all of us just realised we'd we'd finished the race. It didn't matter what position we came in, we won. We finished. It was you know that we did the best that all of us could have done, and from that point on, I think we just celebrated for the next hour. It was incredible. It was such a relief and such this incredible feeling that we'd finished, we'd done it. We couldn't have done anything else. So to cross that line after all the efforts that everyone had put in was amazing. Friends had come in, there was a big group of people and we were just so excited. I got goosebumps now just remembering that feeling of going, we actually did it, you know, like the car didn't work for the whole 24 hours, but as a team, our team worked for the whole 24 hours. And I think that it's in times like that, that you kind of bond with people in a way that maybe you wouldn't normally understand unless you'd gone through that adversity. And certainly we were already friends, but our bond was really tight and I was really proud of what we'd done.
After the race, the most unhinged thing I've ever seen on a track. The whole team gets to jump in and on the car and you get to do a parade lap of the track. There were all these just K cars around with like 20 people sitting on the roof and we did a lap of the track. In Australia, you just can't do this. It's just not possible. Insurances, you would have 10 people with pitchforks chasing you to stop whatever we're about to do. But in Malaysia, it's free reign. It was, it was so much fun. We just got mascots, just little 600cc, pinging off their heads, um, smoking because they barely made it to the finish line. But it was, it was, again, another surreal moment of just 20 people hanging off a cake car, cutting laps around Sepang after a 24-hour endurance race. Everybody, that has been an amazing adventure. Good job, Martin. Well done, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. We did it. We did it. We, did it, bro. we, we did finished it. it. What a trip. That was ridiculous. A whole bunch of mad dogs from Australia. Look at them go. I feel like, for me at least, like I've got so many voices in my head that keep saying that I can't do something, I'm not good enough. But like with the right people that support you and like push you and believe in you, anything is possible. And I can't thank the team enough. I can't thank Marty and Blair enough for this opportunity. I will remember this for the rest of my life. Stacey was an absolute boss behind the scenes. She made sure that everyone was fed, she was working with the organisers, even everything from accommodation. Being local, she, she had the knowledge. She helped absolutely everyone. It didn't matter what you needed or what your question was. Stacey was an absolute boss and looked after absolutely everyone. Stacey's a type of person where she doesn't rest until the job she needs to get done gets done. So from the moment she was selected to lead this mission, she was full on every day at home on the computer, looking up things, planning things, sourcing things and stuff. So, I mean, I think the real MVP here should be Stacey because none of this would have happened without her. Julian kept us safe. He was the guy, I feel, that organised everything with the roll cage and did a lot of work behind the scenes with, with the car uh, to help keep us safe. And he's an absolute gun behind the wheel too. This entire experience was game changing. It was a life event that I'll never forget and it was one of the best times of my entire life. Both from all the pre-organising to actually filming it which was for me a really big achievement but also spending all this time with people, some I know very well and some I don't know very well but it's friendships that are made for life and let's be honest we're all talking about the next event. We're going to do it. I would absolutely do another endurance event um, and especially you know the experience I had with the team was just so good. I'll never forget it. And so I do an event like this, absolutely. I hope, I hope that we can. Might be a different car, might be a different track, but I'd absolutely do it again. I think if you told the kid version of me that one day she would be driving at Sepang in a 24-hour race, she'd think that's pretty nuts. It's been an experience of a lifetime. I absolutely could not have asked for a better bunch of people to do it with, and I feel completely honoured to have shared 24 hours at Sepang with a bunch of absolute legends. It was a whirlwind week. I think it was just under seven days from start to finish, from taking off in Australia, coming back. I don't think I've ever been that tired, lost my voice, done so much work, been so dirty, been crawling around on workshop floors and racetracks. Like it was, it was an experience. And some people do this for a living, good on you. That is not an easy job. A K car race event seems like a simple thing. Yeah, we'll just go, we'll just go over there and do it. Getting everyone there, um, looking after everybody is, is a huge, huge deal but it worked, it paid off, our car broke, we fixed it, we were victorious, we finished the race and we didn't come last. I had this moment where I look out, there's little K cars everywhere, there's smiles everywhere, there's flags, there's color, there's noise, there's people revving, I was like, this is it. Like for me, this is what car's about, this is what Mighty Car Mods is about, this is what being a human's about. I love cars, I love people who love cars, I love journeys with cars, I love adventures and this was the culmination of all of these things that I adore all in one moment and it was something that I will remember for the rest of my life.